On this edition of VCU Insight, we'll take a look at Richmond's new indoor football team, as well as the Rams basketball team and its fans. VCU has a new addition to the School of Business and a professor you may have seen on the big screen. All those stories and more VCU Insight starts right now. Hello and welcome to VCU Insight, I'm Agazi Dasihel. And I'm Derek Waller, thanks for joining us. In our last broadcast, we told you about VCU's new police chief, John Venuti. Tonight, we're taking a look back at the man Venuti replaced. It will have been one year this week since Willie Fuller left the university after he was accused of trying to solicit sex from a minor. Now, a year later, he isn't facing any charges. And chances are, he never will. Former VCU police chief Willie Fuller should have known better, so says Todd Stone, a defense lawyer not involved with the case. You would think that a police officer would be savvy enough to understand that and not put himself in that situation in the first place. That situation occurred January 29, 2009, when Chesterfield police say they caught Fuller trying to solicit sex from a detective posing as a 14-year-old girl in a chat room. By March 11th, Fuller had left the university altogether after being suspended without pay. Charges followed, but before his summer court date, he suffered from a diabetic seizure. Fuller's attorney, Arnold Henderson, said that the resulting dementia left him unable to communicate. He was not in um, good shape medically. After a psychiatric evaluation at MCV confirming his disability, Chesterfield prosecutors dropped the charges last fall. Now some are wondering if Fuller will ever pay a penalty. Is this a case of a man getting away with a serious crime or of someone who can't defend himself and should be left alone? Stone says that all depends on Fuller's mental competency. He says it's common to see that restored over time. I have seen many cases in the past where somebody gets restored to competency and then later, months later, they, can, they could stand trial. But with this case, Henderson says that likely won't happen anytime soon. He was um, not able to assist in his defense. And as far as I know, nothing has changed. And nothing has changed for the Commonwealth Attorney's Office in Chesterfield either. We asked them if they planned on revisiting Fuller's competency. They had no comment. But VCU students we talked to had plenty to say. Um, I think he should be, tr should be tried if um, he recovers. Oh, I think that he's, the trial should still go on. Until Fuller is found competent to aid in his own defense, he will be a free man. You know, competency is competency. If this were a murder, if it were a rape, if it were any, any particular type of criminal offense, it's the same test. You know, either you're competent or you're not competent. Henderson also told me that because of Fuller's mental disability, he believes his client poses no risk to the community. Student journalists at VCU caught some heat this week from a Commonwealth delegate. Students with Capital News Service wrote a story about remarks from Delegate Bob Marshall, a Prince William Republican, after he gave a press conference last Thursday about cutting funding for Planned Parenthood. He said the number of children born with handicaps after the mother first had an abortion had increased dramatically. He continued by saying this was because, quote, when you abort the firstborn, nature takes its vengeance on the subsequent children, unquote. The comments caused a firestorm for Marshall, including Governor Bob McDonnell calling them wrong and offensive. Marshall took issue with headlines like the one in the Williamsburg Yorktown Daily saying legislator says disabled kids may be God's punishment. Marshall said he regrets his, quote, poorly chosen words. On the floor of the House last week, he accused the CNS story of being slanderous. CNS professor Jeff South said they stand by the story. We should mention Capital News Service is a coverage partner with VCU Insight. A university organization has taken time to care for both the young and the old. Caretakers at VCU's MCV Health System have developed a method that takes intergenerational relations to the next level. Young children at the MCV's Family Care Center sing traditional songs, 
in a setting that's not so traditional. MCV has offered childcare for their employees since 1982. Three years ago, they started an adult day program. Think of it as day camp for seniors. VCU employees drop their older dependents off for a day of care and fun. Patricia Moon is director for VCU's Family Care Services. She says they always wanted to pair up seniors and children. Years ago, during an initial program that did just that, and saw how being around the young helped the old. And after a period of a month, we saw huge changes in her ability to focus, her ability to navigate, her ability to interact with the children. So when they started the adult day program, they also started the intergenerational program. Now all five of the seniors currently there during the day spend time with kids in childcare at least once a week. Laura Shaver is one of those seniors. She says she enjoys using what she knows as an adult to help the kids. Interestingly, they brought me into a little boy that was Chinese. And fortunately, I had been to China. So I knew a few of the words. Shaver says sometimes she'll read to the really young children and... They don't know what I'm talking about, but they listen and they'll play with the book and they're, they're very fun. The fun includes holiday programs, exercise, and music. Adult day program manager Dorothy Karras says the seniors really get a lot out of it. Their sense of belonging and their orientation has been greatly increased by having the uh, children around and so present in their lives. Lives for seniors that organizers say too often includes isolation. Now it's companionship and a bridge between generations. In 2009, VCU's health system has been ranked in the nation's top 100 places to work by Working Mother magazine. That's the fifth time they've received this honor. The only other school in Virginia that has an adult day program is Virginia Tech. For the third year in a row, VCU is participating against over 600 other universities nationwide in Recyclemania. It started this year on January 17th and runs to March 27th. The event encourages students, staff, and faculty to recycle as much as they can during this period. Recycling coordinator Steve Heinitz says recycling containers are covering VCU campus, so it shouldn't be hard for people to recycle. Yeah, our purpose is mainly education and awareness. Um, it's just, a, like I said, a great opportunity for all the institutions that participate to just get the word out that recycling uh, is something that everybody can do and it has a lot of uh, environmental benefits. Recycle Mania ends in two weeks, so there is only a short time left to recycle for the competition. The first VCU Southern Film Festival took place at the Gray Street Theater February 26th and 27th. The free festival showed films about African American culture in the segregated Old South. Tab does screening civil rights. Six movies were shown over the two-day festival. Films included influential black stars such as Sidney Poitier and Spike Lee. Organizer and keynote speaker Dr. Emily Raymond chose the films for the festival. A film from the time that shows the development of the movement or is about a particular um, event or march or something like that during the movement. So we have a good mix of classic films yeah. and more current ones. The inaugural festival was sponsored by the VCU Departments of English and History, as well as the VCU chapter of the NAACP. Speaking of art, a group of VCU art students traveled around Peru last summer and the art that was created is now on display on the Monroe Park campus in the Student Commons. Ali Atai is joined by a guest in our studio. Today we join Deborah Shapiro, VCU student and organizer of Inspiration Peru, a new exhibit at the Student Art Space Gallery in the Student Commons. How are you doing today, Deborah? I'm doing great, thanks. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, so tell me a little bit about your trip. You guys spent a month in Peru last summer, correct? Yes, it was about, I think, 26 days um, in Peru. We spent our time between Lima, Cusco, and Nazca, and we visited many cultural and architectural sites um, in that time. Wow, it sounds like you guys did a lot of traveling, then you went all over the country. We sure did. So yeah. tell me, what was one of the more, um, you know, from, from what I've seen of the art, you guys are certainly inspired. What would you say inspired you the most about Peru? Uh, well, there were so many things there. There were um, 
the, the textiles there, the landscape, the combination of Incan and Spanish architecture. Um, the whole country was just so beautiful and colorful. Um, what we kept hearing about there was the flora and the fauna of Peru, um, mm -hmm. the beautiful plant and animal life that we kept seeing. It's really a beautiful place. And would you say that was your main inspiration for wanting to set up the exhibit? Because from what I understand, you were the main organizer of the, the new exhibit. Mm -hmm. um, when we were in Peru, we're all students from the School of the Arts. We're all visual artists in one way or another. And we um, just thought it would be a really great thing for us to all be able to show together in one place, show the work that we made there, and show off um, the things that we made that were inspired by our trip. Okay, and uh, from what I understand, you guys are showing from the 1st till the 12th of March? That's right. And so, t you know, for students that are interested in art, tell them what, what would they get out of coming and visiting the Inspiration Peru exhibit? Well, they'll be able to see um, work that we made in Peru and work that we made uh, since we came back that's inspired by the trip. Um, the trip is really something to consider for any uh, student that's interested in visual studies, interested mm -hmm. in history, architecture and art history, um, interested in photography. It's such a visual experience being in Peru that, it, that um, I think any student who comes to the exhibit would really be inspired to maybe take the trip and see it for themselves. So you would certainly recommend it to others. Absolutely. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Deborah Shapiro is the organizer of the Inspiration Peru exhibit in the Student Art Space Gallery in the Student Commons going on from the 1st to the 12th of March, so go check it out. Thanks again. Thank you very much. When VCU men's basketball releases its schedule each season, every fan waits with anticipation. But for one fan, VCU basketball games have become a way of life. Insights' Kurt Dozier has a story of one fan who has a dedicated relationship to VCU hoops. For Rick Childers, the VCU men's basketball schedule has become a travel itinerary. Going from places as far away as Cancun and Reno, Childers is as much a mainstay with the team as its mascot. 52-year-old state police lieutenant, Childers keeps a watchful eye on the date. As soon as I get a schedule, I'm making little notes and sending my boss email saying, okay, I need this day and this day and this day and this day. Those days Childers uses adds up to a term that he simply calls the streak. The streak was never planned. It wasn't like we sat up and said, okay, let's see how many games I can go to in a row. It's sort of, you get up to about 70 or 80 and you all of a sudden say, whoa. Over the past 10 seasons, Rick Childers has never missed a game inside the Stewart C. Siegel Center for VCU men's basketball. The Rams have seen five different head coaches in that 10 year span. But Childers has seen all of them. Childers attended every VCU contest of Ram all-time scoring leader, Eric Maynard. Maynard graduated last year. Players now that remind me of him when he was a freshman. Watching these kids grow, I mean, you see that over and over again. Rick's wife Yvonne tries to make every game that Rick does. Even if she does not have a streak, it's still on her mind. We've learned and met all these people here and they've all become friends of ours, so we just keep coming back year after year. Both Rick and Yvonne have seen plenty of VCU wins and losses over the years, but there is no doubt what memory is the longest lasting. Obviously Duke. Nothing compares to that after all of these years. All we could say was we beat Duke. Childers has been going to VCU games since the mid-1980s and says he's seen extreme growth in the program. That's part of the fun. I mean, I look so forward to coming to the Seagull Center and seeing those games where the enthusiasm that it's a sort of build. Childers plans to retire next year, leaving more time for the VCU season. But will he ever stop going to Ram games? Nope. Never. It's a great experience. As another VCU season draws to a close, Rick Childers' streak of 170 games remains secure. For VCU Insight, I'm Kurt Dozier. Childers will continue his streak this weekend at the CAA tournament, where the Rams hope to return to the NCAA tournament. He plans to attend every game. The VCU Chili's on the corner of Cary and Belvedere hosted its first question and answer session with men's basketball coach Shaka Smart on Tuesday, February 23rd. 
Fans were treated to a variety of free food and were given the opportunity to hear the coaches' thoughts on the season as well as ask their own questions. Rams play-by-play -play voice Robbie Robinson kicked off the discussion with Coach Smart, which was followed by a question and answer session with the fans. One popular topic was the stark difference between the Rams' exemplary home record and their mediocre record on the road. We've got a lot of guys that their emotional response to the fans in the Seagull Center is terrific. And I can, I can tell you a couple guys specifically that they're just different people. They're just, they might as well have a different name when they're playing at home as opposed to when they're playing on the road. The Rams kick off the CAA tournament this weekend at the Richmond Coliseum. This past fall, Richmond didn't just get a new baseball team. They've also been introduced to a new indoor football team. The Richmond Raiders are bringing some local prospects the opportunity to play the game they love. Insights Ali Atei has a preview of the upcoming season. For the players of the Richmond Raiders, football means more than just a paycheck. The Raiders joined the American Indoor Football Association as an expansion team in August of last year. The team's general manager, Jack Bowman, says that playing indoor football is about the love of the game. Compared to the NFL and stuff, this is really their opportunity to try to get a look by scouts and, and NFL coaches and, and, uh, and scouts. So it's more so for that than it is the money. It's more for the excitement of still being able to play and be seen. We met up with some of these promising players during an autograph signing. Many of these hopefuls have strong ties to our area. Andrew Wilcox is a native of Richmond and starred locally at Hermitage High School before earning an All-American selection in 2008 at Elon University. It's been four and a half years since I've kicked in Richmond, since high school. So it's definitely fun to be back at home, kicking at home, and in front of the high school crowd I used to kick back in back in the day. In his senior season at Elon, Wilcox led both the Southern Conference and FCS in field goals per game. He also ranked third in the league and 15th in the country in scoring. He even got some personal attention from a couple prominent NFL teams. I had individual workouts with New England and Indianapolis, and then at my pro day, every single NFL team was there to work out with me. So it, it was close, but it's still got to work a little bit harder. Hard work, events manager Daniel Hamlet says, will be what the Raiders emphasize both on the field and in the community. This is an organization that is built for the community, it's built for those who would not have a chance to probably go see the Washington Redskins or the Baltimore um, Ravens or any of those NFL teams to play, that they can come and see this organization, that they can come and enjoy a fun, family-friendly atmosphere. With ticket sales as low as $10, the Richmond Raiders are ready to kick off their season. The team opens the regular season on March 13th against the Reading Express. Until then, the Raiders have their work cut out for them. For VCU Insight, I'm Ali Atai. Here's a list of the first three home games. The Reading Express is their first game on March 13th, followed by a home game on March 20th and another on April 3rd. Tickets can be purchased at the Coliseum or on the Richmond Raiders website. And VCU has a new School of Business Dean after the retirement of Dr. Michael Sesnowitz. The appointment of the new dean went into effect on March 8th. Shondalise Duster is joined by a guest in our studio. I'm here with Dr. Peter Aiken, who is an associate professor for information systems, and he is also a member of the School of Business Dean's Search Committee. Thank you, Dr. Aiken, for joining us today. Pleasure to be here. So, what is the selection process for prospective deans? So, one of the things they want to do with the search committee process is make sure you have the various constituencies, both in the university and at the school, represented. Mm -hmm. We had people who were university employees, we had people who were staff members at the School of Business, we had faculty members, and we also had what we call our business community, our supporters in the business community who've helped us raise tens of millions of dollars to get that wonderful building we have down the street on the, on the thing. So those four people were, or four groups of people were represented in there. Our charge was to recommend to the president and the provost three names, and they would be people who were fully qualified to be the dean, and then, the, of course, the president and the provost get to make the final decision on that. Well, I'm pretty sure that it was, this process was, you know, amazing, because it's to my understanding that there were over 70 applicants. Correct. So how were you able to narrow it down to three people? <laughs> 
It's a tough process. Uh, the actual procedure is that we look at all those 70 resumes. We also have the um, services of a search consultant who's been employed in the process as well, somebody who knows what a dean is and how to do the pre-screening of these people to bring them to us. So when we got these 70 names, we kind of looked them over and we said, what are certain things we're looking for in that? And one of the things we're looking to do is to distinguish ourselves, so somehow to differentiate ourselves from the rest of the pack, because when there's a lot of people at that level, you've got to have something that makes you stand out. So why did the search committee choose Ed Greer, what are some of his qualities? <clears throat> well, go back a step. We actually recommended the three candidates forward, but of the three, I can speak for myself personally, he was the one that I was most excited about. We had some others who were in there who were very fine candidates. They had been business school deans or were going to be business school deans. So people who are on a what we call a normal trajectory for a career, you know, this raise, you do that, you move to this position, that sort of thing. Mr. Greer was an outlier. He came to us late in the process. He was somebody who one of the search consultants knew and said, you know, I've been an executive with Disney for 40 years, 38 I think is the actual number. And he said, I've, I've done well at Disney, I've served that company well, but I want to do something to kind of give back a little bit at this point. And he thought education would be good and she suggested to him that he might be interested in becoming a dean. So he kind of put his hat in the ring as they say and our process, again, was to take the 70 and we winnowed it down to about 10 or so that we brought on campus. They call it an airport interview, but it was really over at the Hotel Jefferson, so a little bit nicer than an airport hotel. We spent about 90 minutes with each candidate, and each time we did, we sat and consulted among us and had a little conflab and talked back and forth and decided of those, we were going to bring six back. So we went from 10, maybe 12, I forget, down to about six. From those six, we brought them back to the university, and each of them came here for a couple day visit. So they met again with the same constituency groups, the business community, the faculty and staff at the School of Business, and of course some various executives around here at the university. Of those six, we asked for support and how everybody felt about the various candidates, and also some objective information as well, the references and things like that. Then we met in a big final meeting, and I should say the, the chair of the search committee, Russ Dean, uh, Russ, uh, uh, oh goodness, <laughs> hmm. Russ Jameson, dean of the School of Engineering, ran a really fine committee, and so we all sat down at this, looked around, said, well, we've got six people, what do we think about them? And the process became kind of easy for us. Three of those kind of fell out, three more kind of rose to the top. Sound like we're cooking, doesn't it? I mean, hmm. it's mixing like that. Anyway, in, in that process then we sort of voted and we expressed opinions and it really came down to a consensus that these three individuals were there. Again, speaking personally for myself, business is business. You really do have to know a little about it. Now Mr. Greer's coming to us with some very exciting business experience. For example, he was uh, head of Disneyland in Japan and Disneyland in Japan wasn't doing as well as it started out originally. So he's uh, managed to turn that particular business around really understands what's going on. And when you're a business leader, you learn a lot of things. And so he's bringing that knowledge to us. We're going to learn a little bit from him about how he's worked, and he's going to learn a lot from us about how a school works. Hopefully we'll take it from there, find out what the next phase of the school of business is going to be. Well, I thank you for being here with us today, Dr. Aiken, and we look forward to seeing what Mr. Greer has in store for VCU and the community, which he does, his appointment goes in effect on March the 8th, correct? Monday. Monday, March the 8th. Coming right up. Thank you so much. We're Thanks for excited. being here. VCU's spring break is coming up in March, and for many students, it's about relaxing with friends. For this spring break, I am going to Miami with a group of my friends. It also brings opportunities to give back. Colleges all over the nation offer the Alternative Spring Break program where students go to another state or country and volunteer. Initially, our trip was to help children in orphanages, help them you know, learn English better, and just more so focused on their education. VCU junior Jasmine Flowers will be participating in the Alternative Spring Break program and will be traveling to the Dominican Republic. Here are some upcoming events in Richmond. Start your engines and head over to the Greater Richmond Convention Center for the 2010 Virginia Motor Trend International Auto Show. The show will be in town from March 12th to the 14th. Doors open at 10 a.m., adults tickets are $9, and children under six get in for free. The Outdoor St. Patrick's Day Festival, Shamrock the Block 2010, 
will be held at the 17th Street Farmer's Market on March 13th from noon to 6 p.m. The event is expected to bring 20,000 people. Brush up on your Richmond history with the I Know Richmond The Bus Tour at the Valentine Richmond History Center on March 20th from 1 to 4 p.m. Take a bus tour of historical areas of Richmond, such as the James River, Court End, White House of the Confederacy, and many more sites. Tickets are $23 and reservations are required. You may or may not have heard of him, but undoubtedly you've seen the work of his hands on the silver screen. Phil Karstetter reports with the story of a unique professor and his unique career. At first glance, Matt Wallen seems like an ordinary assistant professor of art at VCU. But look again, he's in Star Wars. So, yeah, so, uh, so the picture of me in the Stormtrooper outfit is one that, um, like, for a long time I kind of kept it sort of under wraps, and I sort of was, I have those pictures, and I sort of kept it secret. The picture was taken in 1997, when Wallen played an extra in George Lucas's remastered version of the Star Wars trilogy. It was a dream come true for Wallen since the original Star Wars inspired him as a young child to become a visual effects artist for Hollywood. Years later, that's exactly what he did. Wallen began as a lowly intern at the legendary special effects company, Industrial Light and Magic. Since then, he's had an extensive and lucrative career, having worked on a host of major blockbuster films including The Lost World, Jurassic Park, King Kong, The Watchmen, two of the Matrix films, and I Am Legend. Now, despite his involvement with numerous Hollywood blockbusters, surprisingly, Matt Wallen hasn't seen the final version of his movies. Of all the movies that I have worked on, they're really difficult for me to watch and to enjoy them as movies. These days, Wallen is less worried about movies and more about grades. The special effects whiz traded in the glam and long restless hours of Hollywood for the classroom to be closer to family. But Wallen doesn't regret the change. I never imagined that I would be teaching, but it's been actually really fun. Students old and new of Wallen's say that despite his shining career, he's very down to earth. He's one of the few teachers that I've had that have, you know, some significant work in the industry. I always feel like he is very knowledgeable about the industry and, and what's going on. Wallen is quick to admit that teaching has not been a one-way street. And I think it's sort of reinvigorated, reinvigorated my own interest in you know, the things that maybe I had started to kind of get sort of cynical about or kind of burned out on, you know. Perhaps teaching was always part of the dream. For VCU Insight, I'm Phil Karstetter. Interestingly, Wallen never owned a computer in college. Instead, he used a typewriter for all of his film work. And I don't know how he did it because I'd, I'd be lost without a computer. I'm the same way, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us for this edition of VCU Insight. I'm Derek Waller. And I'm Agazi Asihel. Thanks for watching. Good night.